Hey everyone, how's it going today? Right, get started here. Thanks for coming, appreciate it. Um, so, uh, my name is Philip Galler, um, and I'm here presenting on behalf of Lux Machina and NEP Virtual Studios. Um, I'll be covering some of the key roles and specifically the skill sets of some of the leadership positions um, that are present across the uh, virtual production space, specifically in broadcast and film. Um, my hope is that you come away from this um, with a better idea of um, some of the possible growth opportunities for people who are looking for new uh, career movement, um, as well as I want um, everyone to sort of get a, a, a much better sense of um, where they might be able to find uh, staff. So this is a little bit of a different position, uh, presentation. I'm not gonna be talking about how brain bars actually work um, or what they're called, but um, we'll get into that in a little bit. So I also wanna thank Epic Games um, for having me. Um, it's you know, great to be part of this and to see everyone else's presentations. Um, and um, looking forward to being part of the story that continues to hopefully empower storytelling through real-time technologies. So um, I'm one of the founders of Lux Machina, um, a company that focuses on bridging technology and art using rendering, display, and emergent technologies. Um, my background is in theatrical lighting design, and in the late 2000s, I transitioned into film, TV, and broadcast. Um, my career has spanned uh, business and technology leadership as well as production, um, creative, and technical supervising on a multitude of productions. So Lux Machina, which I founded with my business partners in 2012, um, is comprised of a range of experts in the system design, technology, creative, and operations disciplines um, who work together to help solve complex and hopefully fascinating production challenges. Um, from virtual production to VFX supervising to stage operations and creative screens control, our work has touched many different uh, slices of, the, of technology and entertainment landscape, from broadcast, corporate, live events, features and episodic, R&D, and consulting. So our work has encompassed screens both large and small, um, from shows such as the Oscars, the Emmys, House of the Dragon, um, to Solo, and uh, more recently, uh, movies like Bullet Train, Top Gun 2. Um, we provide both VAD and creative supervising, as well as engine operation, camera tracking, producing, um, and are a completely vertically integrated virtual production services provider. So our work also covers live events, location-based entertainment, and permanent installs. Um, we're responsible for designing, integrating, and operating LED and virtual production volumes for major studios, as well as innovating and finding efficient ways to do pop-up setups across the globe. Um, late last year, we were acquired by a company called NEP, um, which is a large broadcaster out of uh, is it northeastern Pennsylvania, which is what NEP stands for. Um, they have a, a couple of other divisions, but along with um, uh, Halon, which is a visualization company that does uh, TechViz, VAD, PreViz, um, and Prism Stages, which is our permanent stages um, brand, um, we created a new division of NEP called NEP Virtual Studios. Um, and our goal is uh, to represent a complete virtual production solution from pre-vis and tech-vis, add volume design, deployment, and of course, um, we've highly experienced supervisors, engine operators, and TDs, um, all leveraging the power of Unreal Engine. So, um, this presentation is intended to be an educational piece looking at analogous roles between some of the verticals in the entertainment production industry. Specifically, we'll be looking at the film and television industries. And I know everyone loves pretty photos, so everything you'll see here today has some element of Unreal Engine and a real-time solution involved in its creation. I'm not gonna get into what any of the shows are. Some of them you'll recognize, some of them you won't. You can ask questions about them later. But really what I want is everyone to be able to walk away from this and have a better understanding, like I said earlier, of, of the holistic nature of the industry that I think we're all um, focused on in its infancy. So I've heard the name Brain Bar, Volume Control, Front of House. Um, and honestly, to me, it's all the same thing. It's a team of great people trying to achieve a vision that they hope will impact viewers at home, regardless of what size screen or device they're watching on. I'm not gonna settle this debate. And quite honestly, the name's gonna change a million times between now and five years from now, right? It's an infant industry, and a lot of this presentation is about how titles are generally fluid, and we shouldn't be looking to hire someone based on their title. Um, I'm also not gonna get into a lot of technology. I think you're gonna see a lot of that this week. Um, I think you're gonna get a chance to play with awesome Unreal demos. You're gonna get great presentations from other people in the audience about you know, um, pipelines and workflows. And ultimately, while I think all that is really important and really interesting, if we can't operate those things appropriately, and we can't build teams that can execute on um, and navigate the creative and technical vision of the shows that we're trying to put on, it doesn't matter what we call the things or how cool the work is. Um, so, I'm hoping to transcend the debate about what the name is, hence the title of the presentation a little bit, 
um, put it aside and hopefully figure out how we can focus on some of the pieces that actually make up these sort of beating hearts of production. So we often spend time discussing things like the merits of various software, hardware, and in general products, right, that we might use on set and how they impact our lives during a live broadcast, a film shoot, a commercial shoot. At the end of the day, a talented and qualified team led by competent supervisors are far more important than any of the products, services, or anything else that's happening on set, right? Without them, we can't achieve a goal. I would much rather have an amazing team and subpar tools than I would have a subpar team and amazing tools. And this has been a trend that I've sort of found throughout my entire career, from lighting design work on Broadway to um, theatrical work um, in film and episodic in Los Angeles and everywhere in between. Um, I would much, much rather have a team that knows what they're doing and they can make uh, significantly more out of uh, the individual pieces that um, uh, are part of making a production than any a subpar team would be able to. And so when I'm looking for the right stuff, when you make a team, I'm looking for people who understand um, how to leverage the technology to solve a series of problems. We're gonna get into the specific skill sets that I look for, and that we as a group look for when we're hiring um, in a little bit. But um, so look, I feel like uh, look, there, these individual roles, and I'm not going to totally dive into the whole thing, because I, honestly, I think it's been driven home um, pretty well by a bunch of uh, educational mechanisms. Um, and there's very clearly a level of complexity that real-time workflows place on productions, um, especially as we navigate the emphasis of this. Um, and it's clear to me that that dictates that we need people of high expertise and high quality to make sure that we achieve our goals. Um, I'm, Definitely not going to touch upon this in depth here, but it's important to mention, and I think it's a, a, a crucial part of this and really deserves a presentation unto itself, but um, it's that having a really good team with a bunch of key skill sets is as important as that team understanding onset hierarchy, the etiquette, and I think the variability of the needed etiquette and soft skills that are required on each of these individual um, sets. So the hierarchy and the etiquette required for a, a virtual production stage on a film set, very different than that on a broadcast uh, uh, show. And when I say broadcast, I generally mean live, live TV. And so for those who aren't in the broadcast industry, that could be something like a variety show, uh, an award show, um, could be a, a, you know, a live news channel. Um, but effectively, um, the goal is to make sure that um, you understand that like, I'm going to go through a bunch of this. There's way more to this. And there is a, an entire presentation that should be done, um, maybe by myself in the future, on um, uh, the etiquette and specific set of soft skills that are required. So um, I'm going to gloss over it a little bit because it's a, a very broad topic. But it's very important to understand. So I want to quickly examine a series of the use cases for the staff that we're going to talk about. Um, some of these setups are going to look a little bit different than I'm going to show you, but ultimately they all have one thing in common. Um, an extremely talented team that shares some important skill sets. We're discussing these at length later. Um, so this is a picture of Ben Love um, outside of an LED volume. I couldn't tell you which one, but I should probably know. Um, he's the head of engine operation at Lux Machina. Um, he often finds his work flowing between film, episodic, and live broadcast, um, sometimes even sporting events. And I think this speaks to me of the level of skill that's needed um, and the pervasiveness of real-time technologies and how they are starting to intermingle and blend um, you know, a, a whole bunch of verticals together. And I think we'd all probably agree in this room that we're getting closer to the coalescence of visual effects and gaming industries, right? Real-time game artists being able to drive visual effects, quality graphics through something like Unreal, right? Um, to me, that's clearly the future, and that, that is what uh, people like Ben represent for us. Um, and he has the, the subset of skills that are really important um, uh, for being on set um, and understands the etiquette and the hierarchy of the different verticals that he might be working in. And that allows him to go from, you know, uh, we did a karate competition a few weeks ago, a show I would have never thought would need virtual production, but here we are. Um, and then uh, uh, the next day he's able to be on a film set and the next day he's, he's able to help a VAD um, build out AR graphics for a live broadcast. Um, so. On a large virtual production stage, I think having a team that's prepared for the rapid and evolving uh, VP ecosystem is an absolute must. Um, the teams must be fluent in things like rigging, automation, physical and virtual interactivity, and real-time technologies. Um, I generally assume that that's a given. Everyone in this room probably knows that, that you can't go into a stage and know nothing. Um, you have to already have some amount of production experience, right? Um, you need to be familiar with the language that is spoken on set. You need to be familiar with the workflow that the show you're working on is representing. 
So in live broadcasts, there's actually been a heavy use of LED in displays uh, with moving and immersive content for a very long time. Um, you've all seen lots of award shows, I'm sure, in this room. Those of you in Europe, you've seen things like Eurovision, um, which have been inclusive of you know, massive displays actually taking up a majority of the frame um, for I don't know, upwards of 15 to 20 years. Um, so this work is often referred to as creative screens control, and I'll um, be referencing that throughout this presentation. Um, so these productions generally utilize 2D content, um, but are increasingly leveraging an array of real-time technologies and rendering solutions, such as Unreal. Um, this is a series of images uh, using AR from a live award show called NFL Honors. It's right before the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, this was SoFi Stadium a few years back, um, and a, a bunch of augmented reality graphics. Um, you can see wrapping the room and um, changing the, the way the arena looks. Um, but a great indicator that we're starting to see the um, coalescence of all these uh, workflows. So um, we've seen a couple different examples here of productions that seem wildly different, um, but both represent complex onset environments. So let's discuss some of the different roles and responsibilities that are present in these two environments, and then look at how much overlap there is between the skill sets. Again, my hope is that you walk away with a greater appreciation for the entirety of the entertainment industry. So the goal of this overview is twofold. One, reduce the difficulty in staffing real-time virtual production projects by targeting skill sets instead of titles, and two, to help ICVFX, creative screens control, and broadcast operators realize the nature of their transferable skills and identifying more job opportunities in the market across existing labor pools. And that goes for all of you who are also running businesses that have those people in them. Um, you know, I know the, the industry is feast or famine, as it always has been, and being able to understand where some of your staff may be able to take on other jobs gives you an opportunity to expand and grow your businesses. Um, this has been one of the reasons that Lux uh, um, has been extremely successful. We're very well diversified across the industry. We don't focus in one area. We sort of focus in five areas. And that allows us to, as the ebb and flow of the industry happens, you know, you get recessions, you got pandemics, you get all sorts of things these days. Um, we're able to sort of uh, more agilely move between um, these individual verticals because we identify the transferable important skills that are able to move um, with our staff from show to show. Of course, we still have to make sure they understand what they're doing, what production is, and how to work on these shows. Um, so this chart represents a pretty typical staffing on a, a fairly involved virtual production set, whether it's an XR broadcast or a film set ICV effects project. Um, I believe these are covered very well by educational programs such as the Unreal ICV effects fellowship and educational partners such as CG Pro. Um, because of this, I'm not going to review all these, but instead I'm going to focus on key roles that have significant overlap with the broadcast industry. Um, I assume everyone is familiar with this. If not, I'm going to answer questions about it later. But um, the, everything is top down, so head of the snake all the way down to the team that's underneath it. Um, and uh, generally, we identify these in a couple different colors. So the top is usually supervisory. There's a middle tier that's in like sort of bright blue, and then um, you know lead operators, and then there are teams underneath them. So uh, this chart represents a live event or broadcast creative screens control team. Um, it's a fairly well-known paradigm. Um, for those of you who are in the broadcast industry, it should look pretty familiar. Um, sometimes there is no screens producer, and they report directly to a lighting director, a lighting designer, or a television director. Um, for those who don't know, the role of the screens producer um, is largely responsible for the creative and technical execution of most of the visual content presented on displays in a production. Um, they lead teams of content managers and show programmers. Content managers organize and catalog the immense amount of assets a broadcast show can go through in just a week. Um, and the media server programmers are responsible for controlling the content, making changes in real time, and programming out narrative arc of the content, um, user performances, act looks, and all the other visual elements of the shows. Um, so I'm sure most of you can guess, the systems TDs, the system technical directors, responsible for the web of networks, broadcast equipment, and media servers required to pull off a show successfully. Um, this paradigm was uh, largely uh, developed maybe over the last decade or so, um, but it's been in place um, and uh, seems to work fairly well. Um, I think it's still a little bit uh, evolving, but largely this is what you would find on a large live TV show or a large award show. Um, so uh, a handful of roles that have very different names, but significant overlap, um, and I'm going to focus on, on the responsibilities and skill sets of those in these different positions and effort to encourage everyone in this room 
um, to reach across the aisle to another vertical and broaden their horizons a bit. So uh, I know I use equal signs here, and I want to make it clear that um, although I've used equal signs, I couldn't come up with a different mechanism. So um, these jobs are different. They definitely cover different ground, um, and they come from different backgrounds, and they often have very different responsibilities. Um, however, the key skill sets that make these individuals and in these roles successful is the same. So we're going to talk about just these three uh, sets of roles real quick. So supervisors, head of the virtual production team on stage, and they frequently come from more traditional VFX. They require leadership and technical skills to lead the team. They understand the creative and technical vision of a production. Now, screens producers are very similar, although they are often more financially involved in a project, um, uh, significantly more usually than a virtual production supervisor who usually has a dedicated producer who might be involved in the financial aspects of the creation of the content, et cetera. So otherwise, the responsibility is largely the same. Um, these individuals, screens producers, help lead a staff that is capable of creating immersive content, making creative and technical decisions to help further the narrative and creative vision of a production. Um, System engineers bring all the various technical disciplines together with leadership experience in system design and operations from live events, broadcast trucks, and permanent installs. Um, they're always looking for efficiency and precision and dedicated to making it work. These roles are largely identical between verticals, although the knowledge base can slightly be tilted into each individual sector. You know, a, TD, uh, a system CD on a film shoot may need to know more about film cameras, and a system CD on a broadcast show probably needs to know more about broadcast cameras. Still camera technology, right? Um, they all use Genlock, they all have to deal with time code, they all have to deal with networking, they all deal with camera tracking. Um, but ultimately, there's a, a specific range of, I think, personality um, traits that are, are very specific to these, uh, these roles. So um, engine operators, responsible for taking direction um, from the VP supervisor, uh, making changes in real time to uh, content created in Unreal. Um, these changes can be as simple as making color changes to a material instance, or as complex as reworking environment layouts. Um, so on the flip side, um, in a creative screens control paradigm, where generally the work has been 2D up to this point, but is largely evolving into 3D workflows or augmented reality, we see media server operators um, who are doing much the same. Um, they have a similar skill set, um, traditionally focused on obviously 2D content, um, but this is changing rapidly. Real-time technology blends with live broadcast work. Um, their responsibility is making changes to color, texture, shape, and size at the behest of the screens producer and key creatives. This role is responsible for creating immersive visuals that reinforce the arc of a show as part of the creative screens control team. So as you can see, very similar, right? We've got, we have a lot of, of fairly similar roles in very different parts of the world um, in terms of the scope of the entertainment industry. So uh, we know the roles, and we've discussed some of the overlapping titles um, that we can find as the real-time industry grows and as real-time tech starts to bleed into every aspect of the entertainment industry. So when we look to hire new staff, whether for creative screens control or ICVFX in virtual production, um, we shouldn't be just looking for someone with the title virtual production supervisor or engine operator. And for me, this is like a very specific thing. I think when we talk about, oh, we're, we need to hire an X or we need to hire a Y, um, sometimes that leads us down a path of looking for a place where, uh, a workplace where those titles are housed typically. So uh, we need a virtual production supervisor. We have to go to a virtual production company. We have to go to a virtual production um, uh, partner. Um, we often look past the fact that there's all these other segments of the industry that actually have, although the titles are different, people with similar skills and similar knowledge bases. Um, I, sure many of you are familiar with the staffing struggles on shows, especially finding good talent, um, especially finding reliable and consistent talent that understands how to navigate a lot of the nuance in dealing with executives, creatives, directors, production designers, um, and it's incredibly difficult. And so I think um, what we look for is actually not a title. What we look for is, uh, well, these three skills. We're going to go into depth here. Um, for us, this is what makes the difference between a good team and a great team. Um, so while titles can be meaningful um, and often can give an indication of prior experience, they don't tell the entire story, especially in an infant industry, where true experience is often hard to identify and even harder to come by. And I'm sure many of you can resonate with that and that I'm sure you've all gone out and hired people or been part of a show where someone says they're an X or they're a Y. And the reality is maybe they've done a project or two projects, but at a very different scale. Um, or maybe at the wrong scale entirely. Maybe they've only really worked on you know, really large projects and in a very specific role, and they're trying to move up to a new role on a smaller project, and they don't quite understand how to fit in. Um, and I think that in an infant industry, it's really hard to assess 
when someone has the right skill for the job. Um, I call this the noise floor. Um, you know, if you go to Google right now, you type in a virtual production company. If you did that five years ago, you would have gotten five companies, 10 companies. You do it now, you get thousands of companies with thousands of volumes, thousands of stages all over the world, right? And from a producerial point of view, but also from an employer and business point of view, it's incredibly difficult, right, to weed through who has the actual experience, um, who is saying they have the actual experience but maybe could do the job, and who's saying they have the actual experience and can't do the job. Um, and, and so what we do is we don't look for the titles or the experience necessarily. While it's important and it helps inform our decision on staffing, what we really look for is a series of um, skill sets. Um, so we believe that these are the skill sets that make up a really, really uh, adept team. So ultimately, we're not hiring a brain bar, right? I'm not hiring a volume control staff or whatever you want to call it, right? It, it's immaterial. We're hiring a team, right? And a team that needs, needs a careful balance of experience, skill set, and creative and technical aptitude. A good team has the ability to manage expectations of both internal and external parties. Um, they can troubleshoot a problem, whether it's large or small, software, hardware, or even political. And last but not least, they can find alternative solutions and workarounds to problems that initially may seem impossible to overcome. And it's this combination of trifecta, we believe, believe of skills um, and, and traits that enable a, a team to, whether they're in live broadcast, whether they're in film, whether they're in a corporate install or a commercial, um, to navigate uh, the myriad of challenges that they're gonna face on set, right? Um, so let's dive a little bit more into these specifically. So um, managing expectations, I think, is one of the most important and often overlooked skill sets. Uh, um, specifically, I think VP supervisors or screens producers need to have. I think when we look at the, that sort of Venn diagram, for me, there everyone needs to have those skills, but in, in on the team, but in varying levels of degree, and I think at varying levels of um, uh, amounts, if you will. So um, it's more important for a supervisor to be able to manage expectations, uh, but it's also important for a TD to be able to manage expectations and an operator to be able to manage expectations. Um, from a supervisory point of view and a screen producer point of view, you have to look at managing expectations. You know, we often think of it as something that we're doing only upwards. Oh, our boss is coming to us and we need to provide a buffer, right? And the reality is, and I know many of you have experienced this, I've experienced this with some of you in this room, that um, managing downwards is as important, um, especially in this infant industry. We get a ton of team members who are sometimes green, maybe have the right skill sets but don't have the soft skills yet. Um, and we need to manage uh, their ability to a, provide the appropriate time response for what we need to do next and problem solving. Um, we also need to be able to manage um, political and personality differences on set. Um, when you're on a long show, like these things crop up. You have conflict, you have political challenges, you have personality challenges. And um, as a supervisor, you need to not be able to just solve the technical issue. Like, it's super important, right? But you also need to be able to work with your team to mitigate issues um, and interdepartment issues. Um, and outside your department as well, right? It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult skill, I think, um, to get right, but when you find the person who has it, um, they're able to strike a balance between um, uh, delivering um, against the expectations of the show while doing it in what makes it seem a real, like is a really easy way. And that's, for us, is always the indicator of someone who has succeeded um, with this trait, is that they are able to basically look like it's really easy when ultimately we know that it's really tough. Um, one of the things that we like to say um, is that uh, you should under-promise and over-deliver. And this is a thing that both as a business and when we're hiring, we look for explicitly. Um, we're always looking for people who are basically saying, I'm never going to overcommit, but I'm going to achieve the thing that I'm being asked to do anyways, um, and usually go 10% beyond that. Um, and this is, uh, you know, from we interview, is like a pretty big thing for us is, you know, where do you draw the line how much you're going to commit to? Um, I think all of you know that in the real-time environment, there's a number of variables that we have no control over um, in many cases, right? It's, it's real-time, right? It's happening as, it's, as we speak. Um, things like uh, code issues, per-force challenges, um, production changes, someone swapping a camera out. Some of these are variables that we have no control over um, and over-committing to even how fast you can solve the problem um, all of a sudden becomes a detriment to production because you lose the faith of the creatives and, and team leaders around you. And as soon as you've done that, it becomes incredibly difficult, I think, to come back and be successful on a show. So when we talk about managing expectations, it's holistic. It's with creatives, it's with team members, it's in general in the production itself. Um, so we want people to think outside the box. Um, 
this is crucial. Um, it's uh, you know something that we expect more from our uh, systems, TDs, and operators than we do our supervisors. Um, part of that is chain of command. I want a supervisor to be managing the expectations while going to the TDs and operators and going, I need X, Y, and Z to happen. I have no idea how to do that, figure it out. Um, I'd like a supervisor who has some way to contribute to that, but I acknowledge that on a really large show, um, you know, a supervisor might get called into a meeting about why things aren't going the way they need to or how they're gonna deal with this latest change, and he or she needs to buy time um, for the team to think outside the box to solve the problem. Um, so uh, this for me is actually a really interesting, and very probably one of uh, the more personal um, uh, skill set. So um, one of the things that I find, especially with um, what I'm going to call show programming, um, uh, whether that's uh, creative screens control, it's uh, media server operation on a commercial, or it's Unreal, um, if you don't know how to follow the order of operations to solve the problem that you're trying to solve, what happens is you end up putting yourself into a box. Um, so when we talk about thinking, when we say think outside the box, it's not just come up with creative ways to solve a problem. It's also understand what the future holds, which is a big part of what we're trying to assess when we hire people, is do they understand going from point A to point B, but also what's gonna happen in point C and what decision they make at point B and how it might impact their ability to properly execute C. Um, and by that, if that's not totally clear, I've seen a million show programmers make decisions about how they're gonna order their show, how they're gonna build their timelines out, how they're gonna build their blueprints and material instances out. And in doing so, they think about just that one step. Okay, how do I build a material instance? How do I build a blueprint? What they don't think about is, how is this going to affect the next thing that I need to do? Um, what we often find is that the sign of a good operator and the sign of a good TD is someone who is, um, it often has a computer science background and understands how the variables and parameters of code intermingle with each other, um, but generally understand that if they make a certain decision, they might negatively impact their future. Um, and making a decision about how you're gonna manage or think outside the box um, in terms of dealing with the problem is actually uh, probably the most important thing you can do, because you don't wanna screw up the next six weeks by making a decision today. You wanna think through, okay, what's gonna happen next? How am I gonna work on the next? How am I gonna solve the next problem? Probably what's coming up? Um, and use that to educate the decision you're making now. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. You um, even, the simplest example, you're in Photoshop, you make a decision about a layer, and you haven't broken it into multiple layers, and you accidentally draw on the layer you're actively working on, and 200 undo steps later, you've realized that there's no going back, and you're in a place where you have to fix what you're doing. Right, so something as simple as breaking things into layers. You know, we see this everywhere. Um, it's in VAD, right, breaking things into different sub-levels. We see this in um, show programming using palettes versus presets. Um, we see it in Unreal, layering material instances instead of directly affecting the material, right? Um, that thinking outside the box is something I think is, is crucial, and it is something that we look for explicitly when we're hiring. Um, so, um, uh, effectively, uh, we want um, people to come up with creative solutions to problems, both large and small, um, coupled with the ability to properly assess the longevity of the solution. Um, and for us, this is a highly priced skill set. A team which excels at this um, understands how to find a creative solution to a problem without working themselves into a corner in the future, um, which is sort of the key to production and being successful tomorrow, not just today. So, um, troubleshooting, um, problem solving. Um, I don't know how you want to frame it. We always think of it as troubleshooting. Um, and for us, it's about breaking a problem down to its core elements and identifying and isolating variables, starting small and not letting the scale of a problem create fear. We see this a lot. Um, one of the things that we know about ourselves is that we find ourselves in a place often where um, we are working with a myriad of other vendors and other partners. And one of the things that we see quite often in, especially um, newer partners in the space, um, whether it be virtual production or really for the last 20 years in the broadcast space and corporate AV space, um, is that they will put themselves in a corner because they didn't think about what the next step is. And then when they're trying to problem solve, um, they seize up. Um, and not necessarily an individual, but sometimes organizations, teams, will seize up because it feels like the scale of the problem that they have to solve is so large that there's no way to break it down into its core components. For those of you who are coders, developers in the room, you understand this, right? It's, it's a, a fundamental software development problem in that you need to be able to break down a in very large, complex problem. You know, how do I 
build AWS, right? Into its core components. You know, what are the individual steps needed? How do I actually break those down? How do I milestone them out? And then how do I take bite-sized pieces one at a time? You know, you look at agile workflows, et cetera, right? That are, I think are, are, are really good indicators of how to do this type of work and how to tackle some of the stuff. But we're not looking for people to do it over three days or six days or a year. We need people who can do it spontaneously in the moment. Um, so, uh, really, it's about breaking down core components and understanding how to solve those individual bite-sized bite pieces. So one of the most um, important, um, it's the first thing we look for, actually, when we're hiring someone, um, uh, regardless of position. Um, are they motivated to solve a problem and understand how to break a challenge down to get from point A to point B, even when there isn't a clear roadmap? Um, you know, I like to think that we're all at the edge of technology all the time, and there usually isn't a phone number to call to get help. Um, and knowing how to work through problems without support line is hugely important to us. Um, we do find ourselves in that, and I've been in a room with a handful of you guys over the years that um, we know there's nowhere to call, um, and, and on a handful of extremely high-end productions, you're looking around going, okay, who do I get help from? And the answer is, it's only the people in the room. So if you're not able to work with them to break down the problem into something that's more manageable, you will fail. Um, and I, you know, I don't want anyone to fail, but like, I've seen failure, I understand what that looks like, and I understand when a team completely sees it up, seizes up. Um, you know, we've been on some of the largest shows in the world where there's challenges that even the manufacturers can't replicate because the show has done things like create a scale of problem that is outside the bounds of what the manufacturer themselves can represent. Um, we have seen this probably half a dozen times just in the last six years. And certainly we look at virtual production volumes. They're getting bigger, larger, and you can't call Row or Epic or anybody and go, hey, like, can you go over to your 30 node volume and test this thing out, right? It just, it doesn't exist, right? Like, you know, so being able to understand how to um, uh, make the team work together to troubleshoot a problem um, without the need to pick up the phone and call somebody is incredibly important to us. Um, and we, when I say we look for this first and, and the people that we hire, I mean from the ground up. Um, if you're a coordinator, we want you to be able to do that work. If you're an executive producer or a supervising producer, we also need you to be able to do this work. Now, it's pertinent to your individual field. I don't expect an executive producer to understand how to troubleshoot a gen log signal. Um, and I don't expect a coordinator to be able to necessarily troubleshoot a political dynamic between two key creatives. But I need people to understand how to break down those core components and actually solve for a problem. And in many cases, actually write it out. Um, we find that we can give people a bunch of tools and techniques for solving these problems. Again, so here. We're not talking about titles. Um, I don't care if it's a brain bar. It doesn't matter to me at all. It shouldn't matter to any of us. Um, I, I agree. Look, we need naming conventions. We need titles. We need structures so that we can put people into a place in a hierarchy on set. But before we can do that, we all need to largely agree that we're looking for specific skill sets in people and hire against those skill sets. Um, you'll see I'm not talking about people's ability to manipulate art. I'm not. I, doesn't matter to me how well they know technical systems. I really believe these are the key components that I've represented here to really successfully building a team out that can execute in almost any one of the verticals that we've um, that are actually I think, represented here at Unreal Fest. Um, so to summarize all this, um, and I hope that everyone in this room, whether animation, broadcast, VP, or everything in between, uh, has a better grasp on what makes a successful team and what skill sets we should be highlighting and seeking out. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if it's a front of house, volume control, or brain bar. What matters is that you've mobilized an incredible team with the right skills to create an impactful and visually immersive story.